I'm very happy to have two speakers today, Elizabeth Rudledge and Samantha Sheldon. Um, our focus is on biology and medicine today. Uh, I'm just going to be briefly introduce both of our speakers, um, just to have a background, little background what they have done and how they could help us today. So Samantha Shelton earned her PhD in molecular biology from the University of Texas at, at Austin, studying RNA modifications using a multi-omics approach utilizing next generation sequencing technologies. After completing her degree, she moved into a role in technical support at 10X Genomics, supporting the single cell immune profiling product line. Since then, she has transitioned into a role in product marketing at 10X Genomics, where she helps translate customer needs into single cell products. That's amazing. Really good to know this. Uh, our second speaker today, Elizabeth Rutledge, will be joining Amgen as a business development manager. Previously, she was a licensing associate at USC Stevens Center for Innovation, which is the technology transfer office of the university. She was responsible for assessing inventions within the biomedical field, marketing and licensing to external companies and also facilitating patent prosecution. Prior to her time at the Stevens Center, she received her PhD in development stem cell and regenerative medicine at USC. She investigated mammalian organ systems to understand novel regulators and pathways involved in progenitor populations and developmental processes. Before joining USC, she worked as a research associate at City of Hope in the cryogenetics department and earned a bachelor's degree at Occidental College in Cell and Molecular Biology. This is amazing. We are really glad to have you both here today. Thank you so much for sparing your time on this. I'll just briefly just describe how the session is going to go. Um, I'm just gonna ask a few questions one by one and you can all, both take your own time to answer those. They, those are going to be really brief. So like we are not digging into too much details, but we would really like to know about your experiences as PhD and what your work life is right now, basically. So I'll start with the question, very basic one. I would like you both to tell me how does a typical day look like in your job right now and what are responsibilities are involved um, in your job role? So we can start with Elizabeth. Well, thank you um, for the question and thank you for having um, us here. Um, right now I'm actually in between jobs. I start my new job on Monday, so I can't really tell you too much about that, but I can go into my previous job as a licensing associate at the tech transfer office. Um, and it was, um, it was actually really exciting because I had a lot of different things that I could do while I was there. Um, and so, a typical day might look like having a meeting or two with some faculty at USC to learn about what they're doing in their lab and what they're developing um, and assessing its commercial applications. Um, and then also um, talking to different patent attorneys that we work with on um, you know, getting updates on different patent applications that we have and making patent decisions on those. Um, and also putting together marketing materials for the inventions that I'm managing um, to then reach out to different types of companies that might be interested in licensing it. Um, and so there was a number of different things that I was involved in. Um, it always kept it very interesting um, and exciting. Um, and so, yeah, always, going into different meetings with different people, a lot of emailing um, across campus and externally as well. Um, and so it was very, um, kept it very interesting and very busy. Nice, nice, that's great. And now Samantha, go ahead. Sure, yeah, so maybe I can touch on actually, so I, <laughs> I've also actually recently switched uh, position, so I'm actually in a new position, um, but still at the same company. So I can kind of really briefly touch on all three things, which might be like the most informative. So when I first uh, graduated from my PhD, I started a job in technical support at 10X, um, and that role was very technical. So that was very focused on uh, troubleshooting with customers, basically people who had purchased our products and used them. If they had any issues or questions, they could write into our support line or call our support line. Um, and we would help them um, assess their data quality, uh, help them understand if there were any issues with their data and how to you know, best optimize their experiments going forward um, to have the best results that they could. 
So that was a um, really interesting position and involved a lot of working with customers and developing what sort of customer facing experience. So that was really interesting. Um, the other part of that was of that role was we were also our in-house tech support team is also responsible for uh, generating the um, support documentation that was used by our field team to actually train customers. Um, and so it involved, what I liked about that position was it had both a lot of customer facing experience as well as a lot of uh, internal experience as well, working with our internal teams. So it was great. Um, from there, I went into a role in marketing where the goal there um, was, it was also fairly technical in nature in a way because it was, you know, we work with technical products. So it's important for us to understand them really well um, in order to sell them effectively. And a big part of that job, most of that job was actually uh, generating marketing materials, materials for our sales team in order for them to go out and sell the products. Um, and it was also part of it was developing our marketing strategy. So helping our sales team understand, you know, which customers are a good fit for this product and, and which ones would be a better fit for different products. Um, and now I'm moving into a technical sales role. So I'll actually be using some of the materials that I built uh, to help um, pitch our, our products to, to the appropriate customer base. So that's quick rundown of, of the different things that I've done. Wow, that's amazing. Um, thank you for sharing this. Um, going on to the next question, like I'm just asking this out of curiosity. So you both are kind of recent PhD graduates, right? If that's not wrong. So when in your PhD did you start thinking about your options out there and what made you so interested in the fields which you chose currently? Um, so yeah, you, you can just answer this um, in whichever Torrents you like, Elizabeth can go first. Yeah, I probably didn't handle it as best as I could. Um, I think when I was in grad school, I, I knew going to school that I didn't wanna stay in academia. I didn't wanna be a PI. And early on in grad school, I knew that I didn't wanna do a postdoc as well. Um, but beyond that, I didn't really have any kind of good indication or idea of where specifically I wanted to go. Um, and so, you know, I was doing all the things that you're supposed to be doing, going to different professional development um, events and seminars and workshops and talking to a lot of different people and making those connections. Um, but I, I definitely struggled with trying to figure out exactly where I wanted to be going. Um, and uh, as I was kind of winding down my PhD, I started having informational interviews with a lot of people um, that I had been set up either through my own PI or other people, um, mainly in the kind of VC and business development kind of area. Um, and so that was something that I found a little interesting, um, but making that jump directly from a PhD, um, it seemed like that was a tough thing to do. Um, and so I didn't quite know, okay, how am I going to get there? Um, and then I ended up, um, somebody put me in touch with the tech transfer office at the university. Um, and I started actually volunteering there while I was wrapping up my PhD. I then joined their internship program. Um, and then while I was in the internship program, a position opened up and I applied for the, a full-time licensing associate position. Um, and so by the time I had left the lab, um, a couple months after that, um, I was hired on as a full-time position. And so I kind of very gradually moved into the tech transfer office, um, which was really great because I, you know, I already had an understanding of the office. I knew the general processes and the different activities that they did. I knew the team that I eventually joined very well because they were who I was interacting with while I was volunteering and interning. So it worked out really well. It also worked out well because I was hired um, right as, as like COVID-19 occurred. And so I was really only in the office officially as a licensing associate for two days before we went into lockdown. And so it was really helpful to have that understanding and familiarity to then be at home trying to figure out this new job. Um, and so that was very helpful, but you know, you can always do more as you're going through your PhD. Um, and I definitely think, you know, the more people you can talk to and just understand what they're doing in their professional job, the better off you'll be. 
Okay, great, great, good to know. Yeah, I just think that uh, it's funny because Elizabeth, as you were talking, I was like, oh, I feel like there's so many similarities <laughs> that I have uh, with what you said. Yeah, so um, similarly, I, I also, you know, I felt when I started my PhD that I didn't think I wanted to go into academia and I didn't think I wanted to do a postdoc. Um, I'm actually not sure I even knew what a postdoc was when I started until, until I started. So like, definitely, I felt like I maybe wasn't as informed as I could have been. Um, and I, I did think about becoming a PI more so as I as I went on. Um, and a lot of that, though, was just because I felt like I didn't know about the different options that existed, which is why I actually really like doing these kinds of activities. Um, but then, yeah, so once I eventually reached a point where I was like, okay, you know, I, I don't really think like lab work long, long term is going to be what is right for me. Um, yeah, I did almost exactly what Elizabeth was doing. So reaching out to people, having informational interviews, um, and not with the, you know, I, I like those because, you know, it's better to like start those connections earlier in grad school if you can, so that you're not just trying to start generating a network like when you're actually looking for work, because uh, then you already have something sort of to, to draw on, which is really helpful. Um, but anyways, so it was through my um, networking on LinkedIn and doing these informational interviews that I, I think my profile got a little bit more visible on LinkedIn and I was actually um, actually able to do some like light volunteer work for a company called GenoHub where I was writing for their blog and, and participating um, with them in that way. So that was really beneficial. And that was actually, um, yeah, how I learned about 10X Genomics, which is the company that I'm currently working for. Um, and so really it was through those informational interviews and increasing my profile visibility that helped me you know, get that sort of first um, little bit of uh, corporate experience. So that was good. And then additionally, those informational interviews helped me clarify like a couple of the different roles that I've been interested in um, and like better understand them. So for a long time, I didn't know what the difference between a project manager was and a product manager. Um, and if anybody's interested, we can talk about that too. But I thought that I would be interested in like product manager roles. And what I learned from talking to people who were in product manager roles is that a lot of them had started in either tech support or field application scientist positions um, if they had a PhD. Because, you know, I think similar to what Elizabeth was saying, like there's a lot of, it's very like people who, when you're just out of grad school for some of those more advanced roles, they, they typically want someone who has a built up a little bit more experience. Um, and so for a product manager role, they typically want someone who's had some commercial type of experience and that's can be, you know, a lot of different things, but it's, it's common for people to start in an application scientist or tech support role. Um, so yeah, that was sort of how I, how I, you know, got started thinking about what sorts of positions I might be interested in and very interesting. It sounds like you need to be proactive um, right before you are trying to like graduate or like when you have decided that you don't want to stay in academia, you have to explore your options, build your network. Okay, these are the key things I think we all should keep in mind. So yeah, um, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on the subtle differences between the product manager, brand manager, and like project manager, because all these buzzwords are out there we see on LinkedIn, but we really don't know the exact difference between these our roles basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that a little bit. Um, and if anybody's interested, they can reach out to me more and we can talk offline, but there's a lot of different, yeah, I mean, a manager role, like, well, a manager role can mean a couple of different things. So I think when I was, you know, before I was in this uh, role, I understood it to be someone who's like a, a people manager who manages um, like other people. And that's not necessarily the case, right? It just means that you are managing you know something and, and in my case my previous role i was actually a marketing manager a product marketing manager um so even more even more words um but like so even that has a different a different meaning with like a product manager but so I, there's a couple of different types of manager roles um so a product manager at least at my company that's the other thing is these roles will also like differ between different companies because different companies call the same roles, different things. So always read the job description and talk with the company to understand what they're actually doing. But this is a light overview. Um, so a product manager is probably the thing that people are maybe more familiar with is that they actually manage the commercial aspect of the product. Um, and so what that means is they work really closely with the R&D teams to understand what the product can do, what the limitations of the product are, 
um, and how they're going to bring the product to market. And what that means in those cases is, you know, obviously when you're bringing a new product, it's really important to understand what the demand for that product will be so that you can make an appropriate amount and get it to your customers in a timely fashion. Because the last thing you want is to have um, a bunch of customers want to buy the product, everyone's excited, now you're on back order and they're not happy. So it's a lot of it is like managing forecasting and demand. Um, they also decide the pricing. So they you know work through the uh, different pricing options that would exist for this product. Um, they don't have like the final say on that, right? Like that obviously has to be run through through leadership and presented. Um, and so they're really responsible for taking the product from its sort of like initial R and D phase and making sure it is like ready to be released as a commercial fully kitted product. Um, so that's really the responsibility of the product manager. And then the marketing manager on the other end is responsible for generating a lot of the marketing and um, sales materials. So they're sort of more, more involved with customers, I would say, and more involved with the sales team. So what I was doing was doing a lot of sales training. Um, I would help sales position the products effectively for the different customer types. And I, you know, worked with various teams to like build up a lot of collateral. So this would include things like pitch decks for giving webinar presentations, um, application notes, um, white papers, you know, like those sorts of things. That's the responsibility of the marketing manager. And then the project manager, um, at least at 10X, the, these tend to be more R&D focused and they're very focused on timelines, making sure that everything happens according to schedule. And basically like launching a product is really, really complicated. And at 10X anyways, it involves like microfluidics, um, molecular biology, instrumentation teams, like all of these are involved. And so the project manager is essentially responsible for making sure that all of these dependencies are lined up so that they can actually occur in the right timeline, if that makes sense. So it's like, you have to think of the they need to happen on a certain schedule and they oversee all of that and make sure that that actually, you know, gets done on time or if it's not gonna get done on time, okay, how are we gonna mitigate that? What are we gonna do to move resources around effectively so that we can get it done on time? Gotcha, that totally makes sense, yeah. And there are a lot of differences, not just subtle ones between these roles and responsibilities. Good to know that. Um, Elizabeth, I know you would be joining as business development manager soon. So do you, like, has company given you any responsibilities yet? Like, are you going to be on the top of the hierarchy managing, uh, like project manager and brand manager and marketing manager to align with the business model of the company? Is that how it works? Um, not quite. Um, basically what I do as a business development manager is assess external technology outside of Amgen um, and then see what we want to bring in to help facilitate our pipeline. Um, and so that could be in licensing of a specific you know, drug candidate um, or asset or technology, um, or it can be acquiring a small company or even a slightly larger company. And so that's what the business development um, team at Amgen does. Um, I'm a manager, which sounds like I'm managing people, but actually I'm not. I'm working on a team. Um, I'm actually going to be working on the platform technologies team, and it's a small team. There's only two other people on it, and then we have our managing director for that team. Um, and so that's mostly what I know thus far since I haven't started yet, um, but I'm very excited to um, to be doing this. It's very similar to what I was doing in the tech transfer office, um, but instead of out licensing university technology to companies, I'll be on the other side of the table in licensing um, technologies to come into the company. Um, so I'll be sitting on the other side of the table, essentially. Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> I'm getting to know so many new things today. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's a little confusing because um, business development can mean different things for different companies, just like Samantha was saying. And so I, I didn't actually realize this until um, I started really looking into these jobs is that I think the majority of business development, um, the usual um, definition of a business development person is more aligned with sales and um, increasing customers and increasing clients um, to bring in more business into a company. Um, but for other companies, 
It's more about increasing the type of technology and the type of assets that you have at the company. And so that's the side that I'm on versus the sales side. Um, so that's a, a different um, definition for business development. So you, just as Samantha said, you really do have to read the job descriptions to understand, okay, what exactly are the responsibilities and the duties? Um, because it does vary a lot. Gotcha. Great. Amazing. Yeah. So this leads me to our next question. Um, is there any specific skill set which you guys focused on, like in the very end of your PhD, so that you can transition smoothly into your current roles? Or were you guys applying to multiple roles and it just so happened that you ended up in your current jobs? Any one of you can go ahead first and answer. <laughs> Um, oh, I can go ahead, I guess. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, towards, towards it, those informational interviews are really helpful to help you figure out like what you might want to do. So that is why I do recommend them. Um, and that can help you decide what skills to develop in order to get there. So like I said, so for me, looking at it, it was being like, okay, I think I want to go into product management. Okay, I know that people that have gone into product management typically start in like a field application or technical support role okay so then I was actually focusing on like how do I get into that tech support role because honestly like you know, most companies are not going to hire a product manager just out of grad school I don't not saying it's totally impossible but like personally I haven't seen it um so that helped me like sort of refine my focus and be like okay well I'm not going to try to learn about like forecasting order because that doesn't really make sense so instead what I'm going to try and learn about is you know customer facing experience um and that can actually be developed in graduate school in a number of different ways so um you know TA or mentoring younger grad students those are opportunities to develop um customer facing customer facing experience so obviously it's not really customers but you can that's a transferable skill set right being able to um, highlight that you are good with working with people, you like working with people, you like training people. Um, so that's really beneficial. And the other thing is like, at least for my technical support role is, you know, one thing about those kinds of roles is everyone, like I'm such a huge part of it is troubleshooting. And it's like, everyone who has a PhD knows how to troubleshoot, right? So that's just part of the learning process. Like, so you definitely probably have that experience. Um, just one thing I would recommend is if you're going out for those roles, you're interested in them, that you, if you're going into an interview, uh, definitely have, I think, when I went into the interview, I had a list of like the top 10, okay, these were the times when I effectively troubleshoot something or like, here's how I approach troubleshooting, like here are the steps that I take. Um, so you sort of just like, yeah, you can look at the jobs you want, figure out what the path is to get there. And then when you start applying for the, like focus on what that initial entry pathway is in, in your PhD time, I guess, if that makes sense. Yep, totally. Good to know that. Yeah, I definitely agree with Samantha. I think, you know, going through a PhD, you pick up so many more skill sets than you really actually acknowledge yourself. And so I think once you figure out the type of role you want to go after, you just have to look at yourself and go, okay, how can I highlight the transferable skills there? I think, especially when I was in my PhD, I, you know, you're working on such a niche little thing that you tend to get a bit, um, it definitely made me a bit sad where you're like, well, I've been spending the last however many years just in this little tiny corner of the world. And, um, but now I have to go and do something completely different. Um, and so I think that was um, a, definitely a mental struggle to get over that and to build that confidence and say, hey, yes, I did get really knee deep in this very specific thing. But while I was there, I learned all of these skill sets that I can then apply elsewhere. And so I think it's really, um, you know, having the confidence to take ownership of those skills that you picked up um, and then being able to highlight those in a way that connects them to what you're trying to do for your next job. Um, and so I think that's really important, um, especially when you're in the interview and you're applying to really um, identify those skills, because we all have them in grad school, you know, troubleshooting, that's something that can be applied to um, almost anything, but you really hone that in grad school. Um, and even, you know, if you want to go into more of a communications role, you know, we've given how many presentations and had to put together how many posters and that take that is a skill set. And so being able to identify it for what it is 
and then take ownership of it and then be able to talk about it in a way that um, can highlight those skills that you have. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I probably, I mean, yeah, as I said before, I just kind of fell into this tech transfer role. Um, I think, um, you know, while I was in grad school, I was involved in an organization called Graduate Women in Science. And through that organization, I put on a lot of different types of like networking events. So I think that was really beneficial. I'm a very, I'm kind of a shy person. And so just blindly reaching out to people on LinkedIn um, was always a bit terrifying. But I think being involved in an organization where you have purpose to reach out to people made it a lot easier for me to do. And so I definitely expanded my network that way. And it gave me an opportunity to reach out to people that I was interested in personally reaching out to with a purpose of saying, hey, I want to invite you to come and give a seminar about this, or can we put you on a panel? And so that was really helpful for myself, um, kind of to sneakily, um, you know, make these connections. And then I definitely, you know, as I was nearing the end, I reached out to several of them for informational interviews um, as I was winding down just to get a better sense of their jobs and like how they got there and what types of skill sets they found important for those initial first steps out of a PhD. And so um, just doing your homework on those types of things um, once you've built that network, I think is really important. Gotcha. That's super helpful. So in your current role, which is going to be as business development manager, are all your technical skill sets which you developed during your PhD are going to be transferred? Like are the expectations of the role like this or are you like going to do non-technical stuff most of the time in your job? Yeah, um, well, it's interesting. So at least at Amgen, and I'm sure this varies depending on um, the company, they're specifically looking for PhDs for these business development roles. Um, so they really want to have that background. And I think what's really useful is, um, you know, being able to research something very quickly, not lab research, but, you know, being able to go on PubMed and um, quickly understand a particular field that maybe you have very little knowledge on, but being able to do that legwork and do that due diligence um, and, and being able to familiarize yourself on who the key leaders are, um, and then not just academically, but also in the industry and being able to research, okay, which companies are in this field? Um, what is the latest um, stage of development for a particular um for a particular indication or a particular platform technology um, and being able to put that information together so that you can present it um, and then people can make decisions off of, okay, are we interested in this technology or not? And so I think that's something that you definitely hone while you're in grad school, being able to do that, um, you know, the, looking at the literature and coming up with some sort of um, idea about, you know, what the state of you know, a particular um, aspect is. And so that's something that um, I did a lot at my previous job as a tech transfer office. And that's something that um, I'll be doing a lot in um, at Amgen as well. And so that initial assessment, um, I think is very crucial. Um, other things, I mean, licensing, that's something that I had no, I had no experience with. I mean, that was something that I got to learn um, while I was um, at the tech transfer office. I, and so they took me on knowing that I knew nothing of that, um, which was really great of them. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, learning about the patent process, learning about licensing, um, those are things that most people don't get exposure to in their grad career. Um, but I was fortunate enough to get that first job out of grad school where they were um, happy and willing to really teach me those things um, and guide me through those processes. Okay, that's that's good to know. And Samantha, I know you started with a technical role and then you are now product marketing manager. So do you think that all those technical stuff that, that you did in your PhD and in your initial years, are they going to be used the same way day in, day out in your current role? Or is it more like customer focused and like market focused things which you deal with? 
Yeah. So, I mean, definitely in my role as a product marketing manager, it was, it was less technical um, compared to what I was doing in technical support. And that was interesting to me. Um, I was like exciting to, you know, learn a different skill set and think about things in, in a different way. Um, and, and I liked it, but I actually, you know, I missed the customer facing aspect of it. Um, and so that's why I'm going back into a, you know, technical sales role, um, which this role is also fairly technical, but it will not be quite as, I, I'm excited to try it and see if it's like, you know, kind of a happy medium where still fairly technical, still really about the science. Um, it is actually going to be similar to what Elizabeth was saying was it will involve a lot of being able to assess literature quickly and understand things quickly because so one thing about the products that we make is scientists are using them all the time to do things that are really new and interesting and stuff that even we haven't like they're you know hacking our, our stuff essentially to do things that are sort of a little bit different um and so understanding how what they're trying to do and why they're interested in that and how they're interested in applying those things like that my, my job is to um, you know, even if it's something that we can't officially support is to support them and help them understand, you know, what challenges that might, they might face um, and how that they might, how they might overcome those challenges and how they might optimize their experiments to, um, to minimize those risks. So that's going to be a huge part of my next job. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to have that more technical aspect back but yeah like those was the saying it's like it's a huge part of it is being able to just like read literature and you know sort of quickly assess like here are the things that you might come up against um yeah because you know obviously we can't be a specialist in absolutely everything so it's important to be able to sort of quickly pick up enough information to to help people so this one will be more technical than my last role um but definitely as you start moving into as you start moving into marketing or product management your scientific technical knowledge becomes less important than like certain other aspects of just like working within the company, how those processes work. Um, like I said, for product managers, uh, it can be very technical in like a different way, right? You're doing all this like forecasting work um, or pricing uh, options. That's actually pretty complicated. Um, so yeah, it just, uh, yeah, it depends on what you're doing, but I would say like it varies and as you, as you move up the ladder, your work probably gets a little bit less technical overall. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I had an impression that customer facing is kind of a dominant part of your current role, but it sounded like it's not because the customer support team is completely different than product marketing. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, moving on to our next question. So how was your interview process like, like in the very ending of your grad school, um, how many interviews you appeared to, what were the competition expectations and the timeline for like the day you start giving your interview and when you are hearing about your next interview and when was the final result declared for that? So like, that's kind of a tension uh, timeline because you're in kind of a lot of stress. So how was that process like for both of you? We can start with Elizabeth. Yeah, I can go first. Um... The interview process for the job um, I previously had, it was actually a very long process, which they had given me some warning that it was going to take some time, um, but I didn't anticipate it to take as long as it did. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it was happening at a university. And so there's a lot of hoops you have to jump through. There's a whole HR, I mean, everyone has an HR department, but I think since it's such a large, um, you know, institute, there was just so many different hoops that needed to be jumped through in order for me to continue onward in the um, application, uh, in the interview process. And so I met with probably five or six different people um, over the course of a couple of months. And what slowed it down was also that, you know, Christmas and New Year's happened um, during that time as well. And so um, you know, people are out of town, people extend that holiday break, the university took a two week time period off in general. Um, and so that slowed it down a bit. Um, but then by the time I got to the final round, I had a whole day of interviews where I met with many other people in the office, um, in the executive director of the office. Um, and so that was almost a full day of interviewing. Um, 
you know, it was since I had already been interning there, everyone was already familiar with me. Um, so I wasn't meeting a bunch of new people for the first time. Um, but yeah, it was just a very long process that I wasn't ready for. And um, I actually had my first interview on my last day in the lab. So then the rest of that time, I was essentially unemployed. And so I was definitely a bit stressed um, just because of that. Um, but quite frankly, I definitely enjoyed that little time off. I was still interning in the office, not full time, but I was coming in a couple of days a week. Um, but it was nice to have a little bit of a break from leaving the lab to then starting a job. So um, as stressful as it was not, have, not, not being paid, um, it was definitely, I think, good for my you know, mental sanity to take that little break and um, to then be nice and refreshed when I jumped in. Okay, good to know. Yeah, I can talk about my experience. So I actually, um, my last couple of months in the PhD, I was sort of like lightly applying to jobs, but I wasn't actively really looking for anything. And it just so happened that there were, you know, the support scientist position at 10X showed up and I think September is when it got posted to the website. And I was just like, yeah, you know, I had been reading about 10X and I was like so excited about it. And so I applied and then I got a, an interview with the hiring manager. Um, and actually one of the first things that he said to me was he thanked me for taking the time to really customize my resume and cover letter. Um, so I put like a lot, a lot of work into reading the job description really thoroughly, um, making sure to use, you know, you know, some of the same keywords that they were using in their job description in my um, resume and cover letter, highlighting like transferable skills and really trying to make it a point that like I was the best fit, you know, I was a good fit for this position. Um, so I appreciated that he he noticed that and I think that that helped me stand out. Um, and so we had that interview then I told him that was in September, I told him I wasn't ready to graduate yet, but I was looking at a December timeline. Um, and he was like, okay, well, you know, like, contact me in December when you get closer. Um, and I did, it seemed like they were still interested. So uh, I set up an interview in early January um, and then went in for, for that. And so we did an in-person interview um, where I gave a, a 45 minute presentation um, and I talked about my PhD research and then some of the um, work that I had been doing with the Geno Hub, uh, which is that small startup that I worked with a little bit. and. It was actually really interesting because I um, I prepared so much work on my thesis defense and I saw like most of my presentation was on that. And I talked like, oh yeah. And then I did some writing and stuff for this blog and, you know, helped them like with certain other things on their website. And they were so much more interested in that. So it was really interesting because they were just like, so I think, I don't know, anything highlighting, like I said, any transferable experience um, is really good. But yeah, so we did a presentation and then I met with, you know, I think, I don't know, I think I had probably like four or five interviews after that. And a lunch. So my day actually was ended a little bit earlier, uh, and my interviews ended it too. Um, and yeah, and then I, I got the position pretty shortly after that, um, which was great. I will say that, yeah, I think so. I had you know maybe a month before I ended my PhD, and I found this new position. Um, I'm like, I wish sometimes that I had like <laughs> taken a little bit more time because it's so, it's a lot. Um, it's very stressful, but you know it is also it's also challenging, right? Because like you're not getting paid during that time. For me, I was very fortunate. I actually moved in with my parents um, for a while. And I think, you know, if that's if that's an option for people to like take a little bit of a break or like, you know, have somebody where it's have some place where you can live rent free for just a little bit of time. Um, I feel like that's nice because it's it's a lot, you know, finishing a PhD is, is a lot and there's a lot to process before you move on to whatever you're moving on to next. So I always wish I had taken like a little bit more time there, um, but obviously you know, things things worked out, but it's just, you know, it's there's a lot to, <laughs> mentally it's a lot when you finish. So that's all. I agree. I can only imagine how it feels like right after you graduate, but yeah, I agree. It's good to take a break for your mental sanity. So in the interview process, did you see any preference to postdocs who were applying to those positions? Or like company more, like were they preferring postdocs more over fresh graduate students? Um, so I would say that 
I, in my experience, I don't see a huge preference for people who have postdocs for commercial roles. Um, they're not like not preferred, but in general, I think, you know, like commercial roles tend to involve some level of like business acumen, right? Or like you, that you're expected that you will, if you don't have it when you graduate, which makes sense, right? That you will like part of it, you will put effort into like developing this sort of business knowledge of how the business runs and what's important for, for that. Um, and people who pursue like postdocs or who, you know, are doing like longer postdocs or whatever, like it's more seen as like, okay, presumably that means they're more interested in science and in like doing like an R&D natured position. So what I've seen is that having a postdoc and like I haven't applied for R&D positions so I don't know directly, but what I have observed is that like having a postdoc I think is beneficial if you want to go into an R&D position. If you want to go into a commercial role, um, I don't I don't really see like a strong preference for like postdocs versus non postdocs personally I think we've we've hired. Um, most mostly we've actually hired people who have a PhD and don't have a postdoc, but I, I think that that's not because we don't prefer postdocs, but more because. I think people with postdocs usually want to do other things. That totally makes sense. Yeah. I have chatted with a couple of grad students who are still in process of thinking like whether we should do postdoc, would we get better industrial opportunities after it? Because it's still a question mark. We don't know how it works out there. It's good to know. Um, uh, yeah, I would just say it depends on what you want to do. So like if, if you want to go into R&D, I think it's definitely worth thinking about because it will make, you know, finding that first position, I think a little bit easier. Um, but if you're interested in a commercial role, like I would say like, you don't, you don't really need it probably. Okay. Is it the same for business development managers as well, Elizabeth? I know at the tech transfer office, um, pretty almost all of the licensing associates had a PhD or they had a master's. And um, I don't think any of the licensing associates had a postdoc at all. And I don't think it was a preferential thing. I think very similar to what Samantha was saying, um, it was people that were looking for something, you know, beyond working at the bench. Um, and so that's kind of why we had these, you know, PhD people, but didn't have a postdoc. For business development, I'm not entirely sure. Um, what kind of the general idea there is. Um, I don't have a really a good idea about how the makeup is for the Amgen department in terms of how many of them have postdocs or not. Um, I know a couple of them didn't do a postdoc. Um, I know that, you know, I, I, I know some of my friends who have done kind of use the postdoc as a kind of as a placeholder until they found something. And so they'll do a postdoc with the intention of it being short. So not a full blown postdoc. Um, and while they're doing the postdoc, they're applying to other positions. Um, and so I know sometimes they have found that helpful if they apply to things while you know their final year of their grad program didn't really get anything they were interested in. They do a postdoc and within like the first or second year, they're now getting more interviews. And that might be just because of the type of roles that they were looking at, as Samantha was saying, um, or maybe you know they had more time to really think about how they were, what types of roles they wanted and how they were applying to it. I mean, as so, yeah, it's, it's a lot while you're wrapping up your PhD and sometimes you're not fully mentally prepared to actually you know, apply to the right types of jobs and really frame your CV and your cover letter like Samantha did. Um, but maybe once you're kind of a few years out, you can take that time. And so it's probably a combination of things, but um, I haven't necessarily heard that having a postdoc is helpful. Um, so I, I think it's just a personal decision. And yeah, as Samantha was saying, where you're trying to go from it there. Absolutely. That, that makes sense. Yeah, we are already 45 minutes into the hour and I'm so excited to learn so many things from you guys. I would like to open the floor for people present here. If they have any questions, they can just go ahead, unmute themselves and just ask questions. Um, if you would like me to convey questions to the speakers, please post it on the chat. I'm happy to do that as well.
I guess I just wanted to ask, um, uh, I don't know, I'm like a lot of what I do is totally different in almost every aspect because um, I do music. Um, but uh, yeah, just could you guys, uh, maybe I missed Elizabeth's answer, but uh, what was it like, like right after your PhD, like mentally for you? Like, what did you do like the couple weeks after like doing, do you guys do a dissertation defense? or yeah I, yeah I did do a defense um you know you write a dissertation you then present yeah. it to a committee and whoever else wants to be there and then they decide if you know they give you the okay to um you know move on um I think I definitely you know had my ups and downs with my um my own mental health it was definitely something that I didn't Put any effort into um, really checking in on myself during my PhD. I really, um, and I think that's fairly common. Um, I don't think people um, really take that time to um, devote energy to making sure that you're mentally doing okay. Um, and so I found other ways of dealing with it that probably weren't the best. Um, and so after I defended, after I left the lab, I really took a lot of time to really recenter myself, reassess um, how I was, you know, the types of ways I was relaxing, the types of ways I was dealing with my mental health to really get to a place where, you know, I felt much more happier and just um, much more content with um, who I was and who I am. And so that definitely took some time. Um, and I think, you know, working at a job where, you know, you go from working really hard, really long hours. I was working with mice. And so I was in the lab seven days a week to care for the mice and do experiments on them. Um, and so I think once I got, you know, more of a regular kind of nine to five type of situation, I had more time to really dedicate to um, just, you know, taking care of myself a bit more. And so I spent a good six months probably after I left the lab, just doing little things here and there. And um, and I feel so much better and I'm just living so much more of a balanced life than I was in grad school. So that definitely was a mental journey that I had to go on myself. Thank you. Great, awesome. Uh, Mary, do you have any question? You can go ahead. I feel like I have so many questions because I'm a fourth year going into my fifth year and like this is all like about to start. Um, so I guess like one of my questions is just going into my fifth year, like at the end of the summer, like would you recommend over the summer that like I start looking at different job positions and like reading the different titles and what they mean and what they are and kind of just figuring out what I want to do because in our lab it's like I feel like everyone gets has such a stressful like last six months and they're trying to apply and finish their thesis and everything all at once um but it's also nice to hear that you both took a little bit of time and didn't actually have a job lined up like right when you left because in the lab that I'm in it's that's definitely the culture is like you know you have to have a job before you leave so that kind of takes the pressure off but kind of like what would you recommend that I do guide me going into my fifth year, which is hopefully my last. Yeah, I mean, I think it sounds like you have pretty much the right idea. I think definitely looking at jobs that exist and our people are posting and trying to get a sense of what you'd be interested in doing is helpful. Um, I do really recommend informational interviews. Um, so I actually also, like I did reach out to strangers on LinkedIn, which was, you know, like most people are really nice and are like happy to, um, oh, yeah, sure. Um, most people are really nice and are like happy to talk to you. Like I try to pay it forward. And if people ask me for an informational interview, like I'm happy to, to talk to them. Um, I think those are great to have and the kind of like the earlier you can think about doing it, the better. I think just as a good practice, like the only informational interview I've had that was kind of awkward was when like at the end of it, they were just like, so do you think you could refer me for this position? And I was like, oh, like, uh I don't really know you you know so I was like uh so like you know if you if you approach it with the approach those with the um framing of like trying to learn about what they're doing and like you can also tell them about what you're doing and if if they if they like if 
they think that you might be a good fit, like they would volunteer that probably. Um, but for the most part, it's, you know, it's not generally like the best practice to refer people that you don't know. So I, I try not to do it. Um, so yeah, I think definitely reaching out and trying to learn about what exists is um, a really good practice. Um, looking if there's any areas then where you want to like shore up your skills or try to like do different things to try and highlight those transferable skills. I think that's good. Um, and then the other thing I was going to say is like, you know, you you don't have to have a job lined up, I don't think, before you graduate. Um, but, you know, I also have heard of people doing like, I don't know, I also know it's common for people to do like a six month postdoc in their current lab to just sort of like take some time. And like, to me, that makes total sense, because otherwise, if you're trying to do job searching while you're, I don't know how people do that. It seems so intense, like job searching while you're finishing your PhD. I don't know. I would have it would have driven me nuts. So I think that like I either like finish and then you can take some time somewhere else or like finish and you know doing a like six month postdoc in your current lab. Like those seem like to me better options. Yeah, I, I did a six month postdoc in my current lab. Um, I don't usually call it a postdoc because it's just a continuation of what you're doing. So it's not like a traditional postdoc where you're starting somewhere new. And, you know, it was something that me and my PI talked about less so about finding a job, like giving me time to find a job. It was more so, so I could wrap some projects up and get a couple of more papers submitted and accepted. Um, and so I actually left the lab um, kind of with, you know, everything wrapped up in a nice little bow, which was really great. Um, to leave in that type of situation. Um, but it also gave me some time to then spend more time doing those informational interviews and figuring out what I wanted to do. So if that's, you know, not everyone wants to keep working in the lab and it can seem like, oh, if I sign up for this, then um, I'll never leave. And so I think you have to be very mindful of making sure you don't just continue to extend this and that you're on the same page with your PI and making sure that they're okay with that as well. Um, and so if that's a possibility and that's something that you're you know, okay with doing, I, I don't think there's any um, issue in that. Um, it, it was something that I was really grateful for that I was able to do. And it definitely takes some of the pressure off of having to do everything all at once because you know, writing our dissertation and trying to finish that up um, is already enough pressure. Um, so um, highly recommend it if it's something you're willing to do and your PI is willing to do as well. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you both for being here and for sharing your post PhD journeys. It's appreciated. Yeah, I really appreciate your time, Samantha and Elizabeth. It was, it was like super helpful session, I think, for all of us here and for future students as well, who I'm going to share the recording with. Um, but before we are almost at the end of the hour, I would just like to quickly ask you both, is it okay if I share your email IDs with students who might be interested in reaching out to you and getting to know more about like the seeking guidance, basically? Is, is that fine with you? Oh, it might be more helpful on um, LinkedIn. I'm more than happy to connect with them on LinkedIn. I get emails get lost <laughs> sometimes um, and you get a lot of junk emails, so I might miss it on there, but I'm more than happy to um, um, connect with people on LinkedIn if that's all right. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that because yeah, sometimes I don't know who the emails are coming from, but LinkedIn, I'm happy to connect and talk more about my experiences. Like I said, I, I did that a lot when I was in grad school. And so I definitely am more than willing to pay it forward. Um, I, I actually, I loved it. I think it's fun. So yeah, happy to connect with people on LinkedIn. That's totally fair. Yeah, I would, I would share the word to connect with you both on LinkedIn. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Elizabeth, for your invaluable time and taking time off your schedules for our session. Uh, I hope to be in touch with you in case anybody would like to be in touch with you through me. But thanks again, everyone. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Have a good one.